Good morning. It's great to see you all today. We're in a series in the book of Galatians, and the main theme is freedom. And the reason we're looking at that is because in order for us to thrive as human beings created in God's image and likeness, we have to know what it is to walk in freedom. And that sounds easy and obvious, but there's actually some nuances to it that make it not only interesting, but actually applicable to our life. So we're beginning in the fourth chapter of Galatians, verse eight. It says, formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. But now that you are known, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Don't raise your hands, but any parents ever use that language on your kids once or twice? Yeah. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong, as you know. It was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is you to alienate, or is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. <laughs> it's quite a letter, isn't it? For people who think that the Bible is just about rules and regulations, they're surprised to read passages like this that are just overwhelmingly about relationships, uh, not only with God, but with each other. Um, Paul is responding to something, and it's happening in the church at Galatia, a church that he had planted uh, about five to seven years before this letter is written. And what he's concerned about is that the, the people in the Galatian church are being manipulated. You know what that's like, I'm sure. Uh, none of us are able to get through life without someone exerting some influence upon us with all the various skills that they have available to, to them in order to gain something from us for their personal advantage. And when we feel manipulated, you might feel that you, you start losing trust in your own perception of things. Am I seeing this wrong? Am I, am I not understanding something? We, we, we often feel guilty because people who manipulate can use a tool of guilt. We can feel anxiety and fear when we're being manipulated. Uh, we can feel uh, pressure. In fact, a lot of man manipulation requires some form of external pressure on us, and we lose our self-confidence. We're, we're less sure of ourselves and how to handle a situation. We can get fatigued and exhausted. We feel isolated. All these are, are aspects of manipulation, and I wish I could tell you that the church is exempt from this kind of thing, that the only place this happens is in our homes or in our schools or in our workplaces or other social groups. But the church can also be a place where manipulation occurs, and that's what has Paul so concerned. That's why his language is so strong. The Galatian church was being manipulated, and Paul's calling it out. So, so what are they being manipulated about? Well, uh, Paul had planted this church five to seven years earlier, and when he went there, the reason he went there was actually unplanned. He had fallen ill. It was his first missionary journey. And uh, he had to pause in order for recovery. And so Galatia was the place where his, he just gave out physically and he needed to recover. 
And so this church had started and it was going really well. But after Paul had left, there were some religious leaders who came in and they were very much interested in teaching people about Jewish customs. And what he actually talks about, are you observing special days and months and seasons and years? I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. They were believing, they were being taught and they were believing that if you did things in certain ways and on certain days that God would love you more and God would give you more. And who doesn't want to be loved more and who doesn't want to get more gifts? And so if you just, if you celebrate like, it, it's fine, you're okay, but if you just celebrated these holy days, if you kept this feast, if you participated in this fast, and that's how you know God really loves you and God will really give you the good stuff then. This, this wasn't just a matter of, of about 10 commandments. Paul is not telling people, well, you don't have to worry about lying or being faithful to your spouse or those things. These are little things in the, in the calendar of religiosity and in the language of relig religiosity that, that Paul sees creeping in and it's starting to control people. And he's deeply worried about it. This is what he says. You are observing special days and months and seasons. Special days, months, and seasons. Now, what's interesting is he said, they're trying to lead you back to what you came out of. And this is very difficult to understand because the Galatian believers didn't start as Jewish believers that were now accepting a Messiah. They started as pagans. My, my, my son was in school, grade school, and a teacher asked for the definition of a pagan, and my son raised his hand, and they said, yes, what, what, is, what is a pagan? And he said, anybody who eats their food without asking a blessing. <laughs> because every time that our kids would eat their food without asking a blessing, I would say, don't eat like pagans, come on. Let's. Okay. So. Pagan worship was quite different than what you would see in Judaism. It, there wasn't just one God, there, there'd be many gods. There, there'd be all kinds of gods and you would sacrifice to these gods in order to appease them so that you would get something from them. So if you were a farmer, you would offer sacrifices to the agriculture God because you wanted your crops to grow. If you were single, you would offer sacrifices to the God or goddess of love so that you would find your soulmate. If you, if you were married, you would offer sacrifices to the God or goddess of fertility so that you would have children. There were all these gods and they even deified nature. It wasn't just wind that came or rain that came or the ground that you stood on. If these, these were all gods to be considered. And of course, polytheism is, is not unknown in the world and it wasn't unknown then. So why is Paul saying, you're leading them back into this? And the Gentiles had never adhered to the Jewish law. And what Paul is surprising us with is he's saying, there is no difference. This will be shocking. There's no difference between paganism and legalism. He's not warning against paganism. He's warning against legalism. What is he saying? That you can be just as lost being religious as you can be lost being unreligious. And, and this surprises us. It's not how we naturally think about things. This is what he said. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, I wish I could take a few minutes to just talk about that, but I, I'm, I'm short on time today. How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Weak and miserable forces. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Weak and miserable forces. In, in the Greek, there's a, the Greek word is stoicheia. And stoicheia is an interesting word. It actually has to do with demonic forces that are behind something. And I know as soon as I say that, there are people who are uh, the, well, materialists. We believe in what we can see. We, we believe in, in the laws of science and we believe in physical matter and anything beyond that is just superstitious nonsense made up by people who don't understand how the world actually works. And, and Paul surprises us because, because our world tells us this, right? Our world tells us that, that really, 
there's, there's not evil, there's not any malevolent spiritual forces at work. If everybody just had a good education, if everybody just had good nourishment and nutrition, if everybody just had good opportunity, that the world would be a much better place for everybody. All of these things that happen in our world would just fade into the background, which makes the accusation that all of the great sins in the world are made by uneducated, poor people. And we know, right? We know that if you're really educated and you're really wealthy and you have lots of power, that you don't commit any sins at all. You were raised in a good family. You're such a bastion of purity, it's hard to gaze upon your visage without sunglasses. It's, it's like looking at Moses when he came off the mountain. You, know? you have to wear a veil. No, of course not. The, the, our world keeps, don't get me wrong. Everyone does need a good education, and everyone does need a healthy family, and everyone does need good nourishment, and everyone needs a supportive community. But the idea that solving those problems solves the problem of evil in our world is a very narrow-sighted approach. There are things in our world that cannot be explained simply by giving someone more education, more money, and, and, and a better environment to live in. So, so Paul, Paul talks about this. He says there's spiritual forces. And so, of course, if you were, you believe this in, in the ancient world, you would pray to whatever God was going to give you what it is that you wanted. And, and Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians, uh, the 8th chapter. He says, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, that it is no God, there's no God but one. So remember when we started, he didn't want people to be brought back under the slavery of gods that are no gods at all. The demonic forces in our world are not gods. In fact, this is what he says in, in 1 Corinthians 10. The sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. I don't want you to be participants with demons. Demons are not gods, but people can become enslaved to these kinds of superstitions and constantly trying to appease them so that we get what it is that we want. So uh, let's see if I can uh, thresh this out a little bit. Uh, let's suppose that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll choose something that never happens in our country or our culture. Okay. Nobody in our country or our culture would ever make an idol of wealth <laughs> because we're already the wealthiest country the world has ever known, right? So that would never be a problem for us. But if it were to be a problem for somebody, what would they do? And one of the things that they would do is they would do everything they could to get more wealth. And in a, in a pagan culture, what you would do is you would go to the God of prosperity and you would offer whatever sacrifice was going to get you the, the prosperity that you wanted. And, 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 and everybody goes, well, that's silly. We, we, don't, we don't offer sacrifices like that. You don't go to a temple and you don't offer something on an altar of a, that's got a statue behind it. But there's, there's lots of ways to offer sacrifices. And so we will sacrifice family, we will sacrifice friendships, we will sacrifice all, we'll sacrifice our body just in order to gain a little bit more money. But why do we do that? Why is that so important to us? Why do we want more resource? Do we want more money so we can be more generous? Hmm. Or do we want more money because if I have more money, then I will feel secure. If something bad happens, I've got some reserve. Do we want more money because I can live in a better house, drive a nicer car? My identity will be significantly improved. If I have more money and more resources, I can, I can, I can date who I want. And do you see what's happening there? Our identity and our source of security and our source of happiness is in wealth. And we're looking for wealth to be all those things for us. It's not just if I had more, I could give more. It is then I would be somebody. Then I would be significant. And, and scripture, Paul just comes crashing down on this and he calls it for what it is. It is idolatry. Whatever we look at to be our savior other than Jesus is an idol. And by the way, it can't take the pressure of holding up all that weight. Only God can take the pressure of being God. Amen. Only God. 
So the gospel doesn't enslave us, the gospel frees us. If we're going to thrive in life, we're going to have to learn to be free. So Jesus actually uses a story to help us understand this, and it's the story of the, well, we always call it the story of the prodigal son, but it's really the story of two sons. And the prodigal is the younger son, and he's a little bit of a rebel. He goes to his dad one day, and he says, Dad, uh, you know someday you're going to die? And, and dad says, yeah, I, I do know that. And, he said, and, and someday when, when you die, there'll, there'll be a, a, an inheritance that, that you've set aside. And he says, yes, yes, I've, I've, I've done all of that. And he says, well, well, could I get you to pretend like you're dead now and give me my inheritance? <laughs> and, and doesn't that just inspire such love and affection when a child says something like that too? <laughs> and, and the father stunningly gives him the inheritance and he leaves his father and he goes to a far country and he squanders it until there's nothing left and, he, and his friends run out with him and eventually he decides to come back to his father and not ask to be a son again, but just a servant in the house. And when his father sees him a long way off, he runs to him, he embraces him, and, and, and he welcomes him back and throws a party for him. What's interesting is, and it's kind of obvious, right? We get this. The younger son originally didn't want the father. He just wanted the father's wealth, right? And then, then there's the older brother, and the older brother is just incensed when the younger brother comes home. The, the, the father throws a party for him, and the younger brother is just not into this at all. And he stands outside, and he's sulking, and the, and the dad goes out to him and says, why don't you come in? You know, your brother who is dead is now alive, and everybody's back together, and this is wonderful. And, and the older brother says, you never gave me a party. And I have kept all the rules, and I have done all the work, and I have done all my chores, and I have done everything you have asked of me, and I have gotten nothing from you. There's the rule keeper, but did he want the father, or did he want the father's wealth? The way he was going to get the father's wealth was by keeping the rules. And this is a problem for us, because now, we can easily assume all those renegade, rule-breaking, take it and run away with it people, they're, they're outside the family of God. But the younger brother actually repented, the older brother never did in the story. And what Paul surprises us with is that this idea of, uh, of idolatry is that it's just as prevalent in religious settings as non-religious settings. He says, I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. They were exchanging one form of slavery, paganism, for another form of slavery, legalism. And, uh, and if you think your efforts determine God's love for you, you're just gonna live with a lot of insecurity. And by the way, we only, <laughs> we only feel insecure when things start going bad, you know? You, you get the grade on the test and it's better than you thought, yes. You ask somebody out, they say yes. Does anybody ask anybody out now? I don't know, I, I think there's, there's online stuff involved. Uh, um, and that's not, a, that's not a, a slap. I would have done anything for an online option when I was young. Um, the, you know, uh, we're making the money we want to make. We have our health. Our relationships are good. Our friends are good, everything. And we think, <laughs> I cracked the code. I'm good. And, but something goes wrong. Maybe get a doctor's report that's gonna limit your life in some significant way, or you get into relational stress and someone's slamming a door instead of opening one, or, or you, you have trouble with your spouse or your kids, or you lose your job, or you know, all of a sudden it looks like you're not getting out of the month financially. And, and what do people do? What do they think? What do they say? What, what, did I, what did I do to God to make him do this to me? And do you see what you're doing with God? You're treating him as a pagan. I did all the stuff I was, I showed up so many Sundays, I read so many verses of scripture, God knows I listened to more messages from Pastor Bob than anybody should have to. And I did all of that and now this is happening to me? And, and Paul says, that's the problem. And you are not exempt from anything in life. Uh, your body will break down. You will have friends that will mistreat you. There are all kinds of things that can and will go wrong in your life. And if religion is nothing to you but trying to find the path so that everything in your life is wonderful, Paul says, whether it's legalism or paganism, it's all going to break down because everything in this world does. 
Everything does. So what are you going to do about that? Uh, why are these religious leaders coming in and talking to these believers? And the answer is, as Paul told us, they want you to have zeal for them, not for God, for them. They want you to think about how important they are, not how important God is. They needed people's approval. Thankfully, none of us do that anymore. I, mean, I can tell you this is a thing that I've wrestled with my whole life, and some days I do better than others, but there's plenty of days I don't. I'm going to make a statement that I'm going to have to, when I say it, some people get very anxious, so just wait for part B. You don't have to do anything for God to love you. And when I say that, the people who bend towards legalism, well, then why would anybody behave? Right? If our behavior is to try to get God to love us more and give us more, that's a form of paganism. It's idolatry. But if I recognize the love of God, does love not transform my behavior? There's a difference. The, what paganism and legalism says, if you do the right things, then you will get what you want from God. And what the gospel says, God has already done for you what you need, and if you recognize his love, you'll become the person he hoped and dreamed you would become. It's completely different. It's completely different. If God loves you and sees you as Christ when he looks at you, why do you care what other people think? Why do you care what you think? When you're, do you, does anybody have self-conversations besides me? <laughs> Sometimes it's the best conversation I will have all day. Just kidding. Are your self-conversations as negative as mine? I very rarely compliment myself. I, I don't. I don't go through life and go, great job, Bob. Way to go. I just, I don't do that. I, I don't. But if I mess up at all, the word stupid and idiot come quickly to my brain. Yeah. Why, why do we do this? Have you ever told yourself, your opinion is not important? Your opinion of yourself is not as important as God's opinion of you. What makes your opinion better than his? What makes someone else's opinion better than his? He loved you so much that he sent his one and only son for you so that he could pay the price for all of our faults and all of our failures and bring us into an everlasting, never-ending relationship with him where we could celebrate the relationship of father and son for the rest of eternity. Like, that's a good thing, right? That's a great thing. So, what if someone does not approve of you. Will you become enslaved? What will you do to gain their approval? This is the game we play. So Paul calls us to a gospel-centered life. And I'm really trying to rush through this because this I could have made a whole series of messages out of this, but we're already in a series about this. Gospel-centered living is flexible. Paul says, I became like you. I became like you. Uh, when he fell ill, and we don't know what the illness was. Some people think it was an eye issue because the Galatians, he said, I know you would have taken your eyes out and, and given them to me if you could have, but we don't know. And what does he do? He just, he lives in their homes. They didn't have Airbnbs like we have or hotels. He lived with people. These were pagans. He sat at their table. He ate their food. He received their hospitality. And in the middle of that, he found a way to extend God's gracious invitation rather than trying to, to have an investigation as if they were good enough. And, and then gospel-centered living is transparent. He said, become like me. And, and when he says that, he's not saying, use the words that I use, dress the way that I dress, keep all the, the rituals that I keep. Remember, he was ill. So what he does is he invites the Galatians to think about life the way he lived it. You saw when I was ill, how did I handle that? Did I accuse God of being less generous? Did I think the stars were aligned against me? 
He didn't. This is how I handle disappointment. This is how I handle interruptions. This is how I handle temptation. This is how I handle relationships. I became like you. You can become like me. He's not saying try to be better behaved. He said, you saw. You saw how I lived my life. And even when things weren't easy, God was just as real, just as close. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. The third thing is gospel-centered living looks for possibilities, not just problems. It was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. I was in the hospital to visit someone who'd been given a horrible diagnosis. It was life-ending. And the question the doctor asked him is, do you want to die here or do you want to die at home? That was literally the question that was asked. And as soon as the doctor walked out the door, my friend, his name was Charlie, pulled the curtain back that separated him from his roommate. Do they call them roommates in a hospital? I, I don't know, whatever that is. He pulled it back. And he'd been spending a few days and he knew who this guy was. And he just said, I, I may not have a lot of time left, but I did want to tell you about something that's really important to me. And he shared the grace of God. And he shared the goodness of God. Now think about this. How, how can he do that? He's just been given a, a death sentence. Where is he going to be as soon as he breathes his last? He's going to be in complete, whole relationship with the one who has loved him, guided him, and cared for him his whole life. And that person in the bed next to him became a believer that day. The reason he was able to share that is because he didn't think that his physical illness was a punishment for not appeasing God. When we think like that, we have to assume God is not generous and I have to earn everything. And the gospel says, you will never be able to earn as much as God wants to pour into your life and even death cannot separate you from him. Paul talked about this in his own life. He says in 2 Corinthians, to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time, each time, he said, my grace, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses. What kind of freedom is this? I can take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You could take away his health, you could disorient his schedule, you could under-resource him, he could face all kinds of challenges. And from a sick bed and a pagan home, Paul was still able to preach the gospel. And that gospel changed lives, and it still does. And we have the privilege of sharing that gospel. Whatever we're going through, you don't have to be winning at everything to tell people how good God is. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, um, <laughs> there's this temptation within us to think that if we do something, we can control you. Will you help us stop defining freedom as control and start defining freedom as faith? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.